thank you, thank you, Alex, for that introduction. As as Alex has said, I'm Kenneth Hitchin, and I'm here today. Today, today, the hat I'm wearing is as chair of the ethics committee of the Register of Professional Archaeologists. Archaeologists. The RPA, for those of you that don't know, the Register of Professional Archaeologists is, as it says, it is a community for professional archaeologists. It has a mission that is about establishing, ensuring people establish and adhere to standards in archaeological practice, and that this is an adaptable and flexible set of uh, protocols that the, the Register establishes. The, to give you just the littlest of, of backgrounds and introductions for those that don't know about RPA, RPA is an International Professional Association for Archaeologists. It is headquartered in the United States and the majority of members, registrants, are based in the United States. You can see an obvious comparison here with, with CIFA. As, as of yesterday, there are 4,000 people registered and there are two grades of membership registration. One can be a registered professional archaeologist or one can be a registered archaeologist. The CIFA and RPA are partners. Now, we, we, different, the organisations have different ways to, to describe how we work with other organisations. RPA considers CIFA to be a partner. Um, Pete yesterday, uh, I think, specifically described RPA as being CIFA's American sisters. So, here we go. We are, um, I'm representing our clearly bigger, more glamorous, more Hollywoody um, American sisters for, for CIFA. Yes. Younger, but possibly slightly bigger. Um, the RPA is established in 1998 after a period of a uh, creation period where there was previously a society of professional archaeologists and it was founded under the auspices of three then four founding organizations and so RPA has a direct relationship with the Archaeological Institute of America, the Society for American Archaeology, the Society for Historical Archaeology and the American Anthropological Association. There are things that RPA does and very very specifically RPA accredits archaeologists. There is an accreditation procedure that is, okay, the more I look at it and the more I think about how things are done with CIFA, it, it continues to feel rather old-fashioned. It is largely based on what academic qualifications you have. It's about academic qualification and committing, interest, the interesting word of accepting the RPA code of stand, codes and standards. And there is a grievance and disciplinary procedure to maintain this, this level of accreditation. And accreditation is a big deal because it, it, in some places, some geographies and from some client bases, it is essentially, it can be a license to practice. So it, it's a little bit different from being C for membership. That's what RPA does. That's all that RPA does. RPA does not do conferences, magazines, journals, interest groups. People are members of the founding organizations. For the, if you want to go to a conference, like myself, I'm a member of the Society of American Archaeology, I go to the SAA conference. If I want to read a, a journal, I re read American Antiquity, which is produced by the SAA. And the same goes for people who are members of other founding organizations. So in that way, it is not, not like CIFA. RPA does not provide the kind of uh, value-added events like this that CIFA does. If you want to go to conference, you go to founding organization conference. If you want to be accredited, that's what RPA does, and that's all that RPA does, and it is very focused. It is shaped differently from, from CIFA. RPA has three employees, and one of them is part-time. So it has a, a very large membership and a very small staff load. It has a different arrangement. There is a board of directors and there are committees, yes, but not quite in the way that, the, that CIFA is organized. Let's say I chair the ethics committee. That means that I am then able to sit in and observe board meetings, but I'm not a board member. 
then to think about this is the ethics session, thinking about this as a, a different professional association and how the RPA engages with ethics and how RPA engages with its own rules. There, <coughs> there is a code of conduct and standard of research practice. This is currently under, under draft. No, it is, it is being undergoing a lengthy process of revision. So right now, this is at the latest version of the draft. Thinking about ethics and thinking about the RPA's rules, you search it for ethics or ethic, and the phrase only appears twice in the document. And it appears in a kind of, not, not in a negative way, but in a converse way. It, is not, it does not talk about you must or must not do things ethically. It's, it's it there in the principles, and these are not rules, you, you're, you do not be disciplined for contravening principles. It is about fostering a supportive working environment, free from unethical behavior. Free from un an environment, free from unethical is, okay, double negative. It is, it is like saying it isn't, it is supporting ethical behavior. It's important that this is all about supporting ethical behavior. And then within the code of conduct, where technically one could be, uh, a grievance could, you, could be brought against you, there is reference to Again, it's, it's so not quite saying one must or one must not. It's about refraining from making exaggerated statements that might induce others to behave unethically. So there isn't actually quite anything about not behaving unethically one, oneself. And this is important because ethics are not part of the, not formalized as part of the, the rules, part of the disciplinary, part of the grievance procedure. Okay? Ethics stand aside from them. This is about the, the way that things are, things that, that have been enacted. These are, as I say, the different codes have been, are being updated and this has been revised over, over years, but this is telling you about the situation as it now stands. There is an ethics committee. The, again, a difference from, from CIFA. The, there is a specifically a, a committee on ethics in archaeology and RPA ethics. The committee is there to have oversight of programs relating to promoting ethics. And that now actually boils down to managing and updating the ethics database that Pete made reference to. It's about managing an ethics intern. And it's about promoting archaeological ethics very often through having events at conferences. And the preferred model of events that, are at, that RPA sports is ethics bowls. An ethics bowl is a competition. It's a debating competition. We've, we've talked about things like this at previous uh, CIFA conferences. At, let's say, at the SAA or the SHA, remember that RPA does not have its conference of its own, but we do these things at other organizations' conferences. Teams of students are presented with um, hypothetical ethical situations, which they then, in a very formal way, debate and are questioned on. And through this, it, it leads to developing a, an engagement and awareness of ethical situations in fictionalized but real-world working situations. I personally think that the Ethics Bowl is just, to me, just the best thing, the best thing I've ever seen at a conference. It is, I find it so exciting, stimulating, and remarkable the way that the, here we have uh, teams of students who have not yet entered the working world normally who are just able to so impressively engage with difficult situations. And the, these are difficult situations that we have created and put in, or often they have been real world situations that then we have fictionalized and put in front of them. Also, Ethics Committee advises the RPA board ad hoc on matters relating to ethics in professional archeology. span So <clears throat> the important point there is that to RPA, ethics stand aside from the, from the regulatory rules. Ethics are, are not specified, they are not regulated. One, as, as you see, there is, not, there is not a rule book that says this is unethical, that is ethical. You will be disciplined for doing this and not doing that. So it is the code of conduct and standards of research are what people are, are held accountable to. Ethics, as you see, are not specified within there. And a lot of this has to do with the way that ethics are thought about at RPA. 
Now, this I'm going to now provide you with, with lots of text on screen and probably read it back to you. And you will realize that at some point, somewhere yesterday evening, I think I left my voice somewhere and I'm not quite, I haven't quite found it yet, but we will, we will get them. So, and this, this text is very specifically part of the, um, I'm trying to think of the word, the rule book. It is the, the protocols that are set out for the RPA board and committees. Ethics and a professional association are not the same as rules, regulations, or disciplinary procedures. Professional ethics can then be thought about in three overlapping ways. The first two of these are about decision making, what a person should do, and the third is about what a person should be. So firstly, there are deontological ethics, a phrase deriving from the Greek, for, Greek word for duty. And this is about following the rules. An act is ethical if it follows the rules. An act is unethical if it breaks the rules, and whatever those rules are. If that's the rules that are the law of the land, the professional standards, the rules of a sport. Straightforward. Ethical, not ethical. The, these are often expressed in terms of thou shalt or thou shalt not. And they can be applied in regulatory disciplinary contexts. Okay, but sometimes following the rules might be morally wrong. Deontology can sometimes contrast with a second form of decision-making ethics, utilitarianism or consequential ethics. What matters is the ultimate consequence. What, it, what matters is whether what you've done results in a, in a net positive, whether it results in something good. So an act is ethical even if it breaks the rules, if it results in something good. An act is unethical if it has negative consequences. And sometimes what is positive for, for one or one group might be negative for another. And so this involves a, a certain level of balancing and thinking about, about what is positive for one group versus what might be negative for another group. So in everyday professional life, thinking through both of these approaches can result in confusion. This is entirely appropriate because professional ethics are not solely deontological or they are not solely consequential. There is no universal ethical rulebook which everyone must understand and apply in the same way in every decision that they make, every situation. So this then needs to be considered through the third lens, the, the lens of the third way to think about professional ethics, which is virtue ethics. And this is not about making decisions. This is about being the person who you are. This is about how a person chooses to be. Virtue ethics are about being the person we believe we should be, about practicing and demonstrating good character, about being a person who has high moral standards. It's about believing in your heart of hearts that you're being a good person and doing what a good person would do. So this is not about where the rules are being followed or about measuring up some benefits. It's about being good. And so that means it is very, very difficult or even unfair to be judgmental about another person's engagement with their application of virtue ethics. To conclude on this, this bit of thinking, RPA promotes professional ethics so that individual professional archaeologists can feel enabled and supported in making ethical decisions and in working professionally and ethically. RPA does not judge or pronounce on professional ethics. It provides this material to support people in thinking about what being, what being ethical means, but it does not set rules. It does not declare that this, this person is ethical and this person is not. So that concludes that bit of presentation about introducing RPA and RPA's approach to, to professional ethics. The, there is a standard ethics and standards joke which um, must be applied in every uh, conference session about talking about ethics and standards. I think it's not impossible that we might hear this again. This concept that ethical codes are like toothbrushes because everyone thinks you should have them, but I don't want to share yours with me. Anyway, thank you very much.